morning. Great. Thanks, everybody. Good morning from Midtown Cleveland, and thanks for joining us virtually again here on a sunny day in our offices at the Agora on Euclid Avenue. I'm Richard Varga, Vice President of Economic Development. And thanks for joining us for another installment of uh, Innovation Intersections, a series designed to demystify the term innovation and invite our community to explore how we can intersect with these new and disruptive technologies. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Dr. Matabushi from Case Western Reserve on artificial intelligence and medicine. And a special thank you to our partners listed here who have helped market and provide content for our upcoming events. A quick run through of the event before we get started. After some brief introductions, we'll have a presentation followed by some time for Q&A. And for those who may be joining us for the first time, we wanted to take a minute and just talk about why we are launching this series. The strategy to establish the Health Tech Corridor along Euclid Avenue has resulted in substantial reinvestment, focusing on tech and innovation growth on the RTA bus line. And over the last 10 years, we've really seen and reversed decades of demolition and disinvestment. And while efforts are underway to build upon these investments, East 66th Street has emerged as an asset-rich north-south connection as well. And efforts are underway to create an inclusive community-based streetscape to connect Midtown and the Huff community. Culminating in Midtown's Innovation District, a place designed to foster these intentional intersections between residents, entrepreneurs, scientists, and businesses, catalyzing economic growth and creating a economic opportunity for all. So hopefully one day we'll be able to hold these sessions in person here at East 66 and Euclid. But now let me turn it over to our host, Tegan Horton, also known as The Tegan. <laughs> Good morning, Tegan. Tegan is a storyteller translating knowledge through data, marketing, and technology. Currently, she's a podcaster and tech innovation strategist, the founder of Founder Gets, Founders Get Funds, a podcast and newsletter helping founders get capital together by sharing information on the culture of money, and also the co-founder of Lay of the Land, a weekly podcast mapping tech innovation in Cleveland, helping to support Cleveland's entrepreneurial community. She's committed to, be, to being a bridge for global entrepreneurial community. Tegan, thanks for hosting today, and let me turn it over to you. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Hey, everyone, we are back for another conversation uh, for the Midtown Cleveland's Innovation Intersection series. And today I have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Anat Matabushi. Dr. Nat Matabushi is director of the Center for Computational Imaging and Personalized Diagnostics and Donald Institute professor. He's the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Case Western Reserve University as well. He's also a research health scientist at the Louis Stokes Cleveland Veterans Administration Medical Center. Dr. Matabushi has authored over 400 peer-reviewed publications and over 100 patents issued or pending. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering and the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers and the National Academy of Inventors. His work on smart imaging computers for identifying lung cancer patients who need chemotherapy was called out by Prevention Magazine as one of the top 10 medical breakthroughs of 2018. In 2019, Nature Magazine held him as one of the five scientists developing offbeat and innovative approaches for cancer research. Dr. Matabushi was named to the pathologist power list in 2019 and 2020. Now, I would love for everyone listening to introduce yourselves as well in the chat, add your name, your title, your organization, and LinkedIn, uh, so that you can meet others that are listening in. 
And now I'll invite Dr. Matabushi to lead us in a presentation on his research on AI in medicine, and we'll follow that by a live Q&A. So please feel free to drop any relevant questions into the chat. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pagan. Thank you so much, Richard, um, and others for having invited me. A uh, real pleasure to be here. Um, pity that we're still not able to do this in person yet, but it looks like we're getting closer and closer. Um, so without further ado, um, it gives me great pleasure to talk about the work that is ongoing in the Center for Computational Imaging and Personalized Diagnostics at Case Western Reserve University, but like Tegan also mentioned, through my association with the Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center, we are developing and applying technologies like artificial intelligence in the context of precision medicine. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the work that we're doing, but also I think the tremendous opportunity that exists in this particular area, particularly for Cleveland. And I wanna start off today by really contextualizing this talk in the, uh, the context of cancer, though, as you will see later on, the implications of these kinds of technologies really extend beyond cancer in cardiovascular disease and kidney disease and ophthalmology. But cancer, of course, is a disease that too many people are unfortunately touched by. Some really startling statistics here. One in two men in the United States will be diagnosed with some form of cancer in his lifetime. For women that Statistic is only marginally better. One in three women would be diagnosed with some form of cancer in her lifetime, meaning that about 40% of men and women in the United States would be diagnosed with some form of cancer. Now, while those are really staggering statistics, when you actually look at the mortality on account of cancer, there's a little bit of a disconnect between the number of men and women who will die on account of cancer in any given year compared to the number of men and women that are going to be diagnosed with some form of cancer. So I don't mean to trivialize 600,000 deaths per year on account of cancer, but when you look at about a 40% diagnostic incidence rate and the mortality rate, clearly there's a bit of a disconnect. And so one of the obvious questions that then arises is what is the reason for this disconnect? One of the things that we do know is that over the last two decades with more aggressive use of imaging, with the development of biomarkers, we have been able to identify cancer at a much earlier stage. And one of the things that we know about cancer in general is that the earlier you're able to identify cancer, the better the outcome, the better the prognosis. We also have better treatments at our disposal. Immunotherapy, which I'll talk about briefly, really has changed the landscape in the way we treat cancer today. Immunotherapy, a class of drugs that were based off targeting the body's immune system and that actually won the Nobel Prize in medicine in 2018, has really been a game changer for many different cancers, including lung cancer and melanoma. But if we're completely honest, one of the big reasons for this disconnect between the mortality rate and the diagnostic incidence rate of cancer is clearly the fact that we are over-diagnosing and over-treating a number of cancers. So let's pause for a second to think about what that means. Prostate cancer is a classic case in point of over-diagnosis of disease. Now, one in seven men in the United States will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in his lifetime. The fact is that if you're a male and you live long enough, chances are that you're going to be diagnosed with prostate cancer at some point. But the fact is also that only one in 40 men will actually die on account of prostate cancer. So chances are that you're more likely to die with prostate cancer rather than on account of prostate cancer. In most cases, the prostate cancer that's diagnosed tends to be fairly indolent, less aggressive, meaning that you probably don't need any sort of intervention or aggressive intervention, meaning that surgery may not be needed or radiation therapy may not be needed. And yet the vast majority of men diagnosed with prostate cancer in our country tend to be treated with fairly aggressive treatments like surgery, like radiation therapy, even though 
the vast majority of those men could probably have benefited without any intervention alone. And the reason why we don't want to overtreat these cancers is because we know about patient toxicity. We know that any intervention, such as radiation, such as surgery, is going to have deleterious side effects. But beyond the patient centric toxicity, the patient centric side effects of this overtreatment and overdiagnosis, we have to acknowledge that there is a very real issue of financial toxicity. A lot of these interventions, a lot of these drugs are expensive. And we are all too familiar with statistics like this, where so many men and women in the United States every year find themselves on the brink of bankruptcy very soon following a cancer diagnosis. And a large part of this really has to do with the fact that we end up overdiagnosing and overtreating a number of cancers that probably would have benefited from either minimal intervention or no intervention at all. And a big part of this has to do with the cost of the drugs. Immunotherapy, which I mentioned before, which I'll come back to subsequently in my talk, is one of those classes of drugs that has you know, amazing response in a certain subset of patients, but is also extremely expensive. We're talking about $250,000 for this drug per patient per year, but with a response rate that's only about 25 or 30%. And so our group has really been thinking about the utility of tools like artificial intelligence, not just to help in the identification of diseases like cancer, because that's clearly important. We wanna make sure that we can provide decision support tools for the radiologists, for the pathologists, when they're looking at a CT scan or an MRI scan, that these tools can play a role in identifying subtle patterns that a human reader might miss. And so clearly there's a big role for these tools to play in the diagnosis and the detection of cancer. But at the same time, like I mentioned, 40% of the adult population will be diagnosed with some form of cancer in their lifetime. And therefore, a big question that now emerges is how do we deal with these patients? How do we treat these patients? How do we best manage them following their diagnosis? And so a lot of what our group has been focused on has been the utility of AI tools with routinely acquired data. We're talking about CT scans, MRI scans, biopsy images, pathology images, biopsy tissue images, to be able to predict the severity of the disease, be able to predict the outcome of the disease, be able to predict which patients are going to respond to certain therapies, which patients are going to benefit from more aggressive therapies versus those patients who could actually uh, avoid more aggressive uh, treatments. And so, that's a big part of what we're doing. The other piece of our work has been focused over the last three to four years on also trying to understand the role of artificial intelligence in addressing disparities, in addressing the fact that a lot of our community members, underrepresented group, minority groups, why are there such large discrepancies in mortality, in incidence of diseases like cancer, prostate cancer is a, is a case in point that I'll talk about, between say African-American men versus Caucasian-American men. And what role could artificial intelligence play in helping to uh, sort of level the playing field as it were? And could we use these technologies to help address this gap in cancer disparities? So what I'd like to do over the next few slides is give you a rundown of some of the technologies that our group has been developing in various different areas and, and conclude perhaps with some uh, vision of where we're headed next and where we could be going. So I wanna start off with some of the work in the disease diagnosis domain that's really being led by one of the uh, faculty in our group and in biomedical engineering, Dr. Pallavi Tiwari. And our group working with Dr. Tiwari's group has been looking at the problem of distinguishing radiation treatment from tumor recurrence in the context of brain tumors. So brain tumors, uh, particularly GBMs, are very, very lethal. They tend to have very, very poor prognosis. And usually most of brain tumor patients tend to be treated with chemotherapy and radiation. Now, when these patients following treatment come back for a follow-up MRI scan, very often there'll be something that shows up on the MRI scan. And for oncologists, for radiologists, it's very difficult to tell what that suspicious pattern on the MRI scan is. Is that a return of the disease? Has the cancer come back? 
Or is this just an effect of the chemotherapy and the radiation? A phenomenon called radiation necrosis, which really is an effect of the radiation treatment that was used to treat the cancer. But because visually these patterns are so similar, and it's really difficult to tell what is benign radiation necrosis, which is not lethal, versus the tumor recurrence, which obviously is lethal. Because of the inability to visually discern those differences, very often an intervention tends to take place. That is a cranial biopsy, intracranial biopsy, which is uh, in, you know, invasive. It involves sort of drilling a hole through the skull, getting this piece of tissue, and also a very expensive procedure, a $50,000 procedure. But it turns out that with tools like the ones that we're developing in our group, we're able to analyze these MRI scans in a way that goes above and beyond what the visual human system can prize out by essentially prizing out subtle patterns relating to the orientation of edges on a pixel by pixel basis and looking at the directionality of these edges, we're able to convert the routine MRI scans into maps like these that can actually reveal so much more than based on visual assessment alone. And so in other words, we're able to convert these MRI scans into these maps that we call entropy maps, where the red represents areas where there's a great deal of heterogeneity. And we know one thing about cancer is that it tends to be very heterogeneous. And so even though visually one is not able to pick up this heterogeneity, it's clearly picked up by these AI tools, by these computational image analysis tools, so that now when you look at a lot of red, there's a higher likelihood that what you're looking at is a tumor recurrence versus if there's largely blue, essentially reflecting a lower degree of heterogeneity, uh, chances are that, that is radiation necrosis. And so our data has actually shown that this tool that we call NeuroRad Vision is ab able to significantly outperform human readers in distinguishing radiation necrosis from tumor recurrence. So that's just one example of where these technologies can have an impact. Another area that we've been working on very actively over the last four years has been in developing AI technologies for lung cancer diagnosis. Now, not to alarm folks on the call, but if you grew up in Cleveland, if you grew up in the Midwest, in the Ohio Valley River region, chances are that you were exposed to an infection called histoplasmosis, fungal infection. Now, because you were exposed to this fungal infection, chances are pretty high that if you were to get a chest CT scan for any reason at all, there's a pretty high likelihood, about a one in two likelihood, that a nodule is going to show up on your CT scan. Now, there's nothing to be alarmed about because that nodule is completely benign. It won't bother you, won't affect you. But the problem is if you get a CT scan, a chest CT scan for any reason, and that nodule shows up, radiologists will have to figure out what to do with it. And because, again, visually they're unable to tell whether that nodule is because of the fungal infection or is it because of lung cancer, chances are that you're going to have to end up getting uh, more CT scans. A uh, number of patients might end up getting biopsied. They might end up getting bronchoscopy. Some of them might end up getting surgery. Some of them might end up getting radiation therapy. And the big question here is how could we, in a non-invasive way, better distinguish between a nodule that is on account of the fungal infection versus a nodule that truly represents lung cancer. And so we developed with our AI technologies a tool, toolkit called Lunaris that essentially helps to identify fungal infection from lung cancers. And the main idea is that by helping to reduce the number of nodules that radiologists currently identify as suspicious or, or indeterminate, we can subsequently cut down, substantially cut down, the number of unnecessary interventions to be able to rule out the possibility of cancer. So essentially using AI now to cut down on unnecessary biopsies, to cut down on unnecessary surgical interventions, unnecessary bronchoscopies. This is a huge opportunity, again, to sort of address this issue of financial toxicity that I previously spoke about. And the beauty, again, is the fact that artificial intelligence can go in and look at these nodules on CT scans in a way that humans simply don't have the granularity to be able to appreciate. So I'm talking about looking at subtle patterns with respect to the shape and the appearance of the nodules, looking at texture patterns, these entropy patterns that I previously talked about, looking at those texture patterns in the nodule outside the nodule. And beyond 
these patterns of the nodule. In fact, being able to look at patterns relating to the tortuosity of the vessels associated with the nodule. One of the breakthroughs that our group has made has been that if you look at benign granulomas versus adenocarcinomas or, or cancers, the twistedness of the vessels that are associated with the nodule are also different. What we found is that granulomas, which are benign, essentially tend to be fairly smooth, non-tortuous. On the other hand, carcinomas tend to be very twisted and very convoluted. And so essentially by using AI to find quantitative measurements that reflect this twistedness of the vessels that are associated with the nodules, we actually now can do a really good job in distinguishing what is benign from what is malignant or cancer. And in fact, data in data, we've shown that this approach can actually significantly improve the performance of human readers by about 30% in distinguishing between benign fungal infections versus adenocarcinomas. Another area of active research in our group is around prostate cancer. Working with Dr. Lee Ponsky at the University Hospitals, Eric Klein at the Cleveland Clinic, and, and several other groups uh, in Cleveland and nationally, our team has been developing artificial intelligence with routine MRI scans to be able to identify in a non-invasive way as to where, A, whether cancer is actually present, and B, if the cancer is present, where exactly is it present within the prostate. And this is really critical because this is, again, a way of reducing unnecessary biopsies because we know that the current test that exists for detection of prostate cancer, the prostate-specific antigen or PSA, is an imperfect test. And since it serves very often as a basis for doing a biopsy, we know that a lot of men without prostate cancer, but with a high PSA, will end up getting biopsy for really no good reason. And so we, working with our clinical colleagues, are using artificial intelligence with MRI to help obviate unnecessary biopsies in men with elevated PSA, but also critically help serve as a guide so that when a biopsy is being performed, you're able to go in and target exactly where the cancer might be. So that's on the diagnosis side. But like I said, 40% of the US population will be diagnosed with some form of cancer. So what can we do to be able to better manage and assist with treatment regimens for these cancer patients? And so a lot of our recent effort has really been focused on the utility of artificial intelligence to predict outcome and treatment benefit and treatment response for cancer patients. And one of the areas that we've been working on for a number of years now is in the area of breast cancer, because we know that many breast cancer patients, particularly early stage breast cancer patients, actually will not need chemotherapy. Right? The vast majority of them will actually do quite well without chemotherapy. About 70% of them will do fine with just surgery and hormonal therapy alone. And yet, we just don't have very good affordable tools that can really help identify which women could avoid the chemotherapy versus women uh, that will benefit from the chemotherapy because they have more aggressive breast cancer. Now, there are tools that exist that use expensive gene expression-based molecular technologies to be able to figure out which cancers are more aggressive and therefore need chemotherapy versus which ones will not. Uh, an example of one of these expensive molecular technologies is Oncotype BX. It's a, a test that's been around for a number of years, but it's about a $4,000 test. So this is, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive here in the United States. It's unaffordable in most parts of the world, particularly low and middle income countries. But it turns out that there's a lot of information that is embedded in biopsies. So if you talk about any cancer patient, chances are that they're going to get a biopsy. And that biopsy is going to result in a glass slide that the pathologist looks at. Now, with the advent of whole slide imaging technologies, in other words, technologies where you can put these glass slides and convert them into digital images, this technology has really emerged over the last two decades. It means that we can now take these biopsy samples, digitize them, and then start to apply artificial intelligence technologies to start to interrogate subtle patterns of the disease from routine biopsies. Right? So we're not talking about expensive technologies, we're talking about the digitization of glass slides that's then going to be analyzed by artificial intelligence. And again, you can appreciate here that with the artificial intelligence, we're able to pick up subtle patterns of the arrangement of cells, the, the texture and the heterogeneity patterns of the different tumor compartments, the epithelium, the stroma, and we're able to convert 
this digital image of a biopsy into very rich quantitative information. And so about 12 years ago, myself and Dr. Sridhar Ganesan, a breast oncologist colleague of mine, came up with the idea of the IBRIS score or the image-based risk score. And the basic idea was that using AI, we could start to interrogate routinely acquired biopsy slides, biopsy images. And from those biopsy images, the patterns that the AI could prize out could provide a way of figuring out which cancers were more aggressive and therefore would need chemotherapy versus those that were less aggressive and possibly could avoid the chemotherapy. So we started a company, the company uh, subsequently went on to get acquired and, and we've started out with breast cancer, but this technology has really moved in, in many, many different directions. And I'll show a couple of uh, different applications of this IBRIS technology. One, like I said, in the context of breast cancer, where using the AI tools with routine biopsy images, we're able to look at patterns relating to the arrangement of cells, looking at the arrangement of, of mitotic figures and tubules, different patterns that pathologists routinely look at visually on these slides. But because that examination is qualitative, there's a great deal of inter-reader variability among pathologists. But with the machine, with the AI, we're able to get very rigorous, reproducible, quantitative assessments of the patterns of the tumor. And as you can see in the results, sorry, there's a lot of information there. But the point is that these AI-derived patterns are able to prognosticate which patients will have a recurrence of the disease. That is, in other words, they're more aggressive and therefore will benefit from chemotherapy versus those patients who will, are likely to not have recurrence and therefore have less aggressive disease and therefore possibly could avoid the chemotherapy. And in fact, we've now shown in data, not just here in Cleveland, but from many sites across the country. And in fact, data from the Tata Cancer Center in Mumbai as well, that these technologies can really do a really good job in stratifying the aggressiveness of these breast cancer patients. I talked about prostate cancer earlier and prostate cancer, the diagnostic piece is really important, but beyond the diagnosis, being able to identify which patients after surgery are going to have a recurrence of prostate cancer is really critical in being able to identify which patients might need additional management or additional intervention after surgery. Would they need chemotherapy, for instance? And in data we just recently put out, we were able to demonstrate that we could do a really good job in stratifying the aggressiveness of these prostate cancer patients just based off tissue images alone. And in fact, going head to head with a $3,000 gene expression-based test, a molecular-based test, we've shown that our IBRIS algorithm uh, was comparable to this very expensive test. In fact, when we combine the IBRIS image features, our digital AI algorithms, with two very simple clinical parameters, we were actually able to demonstrate that we could do almost twice as well as this very expensive molecular-based test. And so this is sort of my tongue-in-cheek sort of value proposition, if you will, for this IBRIS technology, right? So you've got the molecular test that uses expensive tissue destructive gene expression technology. So why do you need IBRIS? Well, one is the cost. Uh, you know, these molecular tests are three, $4,000. With IBRIS, because it's a digital AI test, it could be done for pennies on the dollar. Uh, you're talking about something that's really rapid, that the turnaround time of maybe 20 minutes, because you're not physically shipping tissue, you're not destroying any tissue, and therefore you could have a global impact. In other words, you have an inexpensive, fast, reliable, accessible prognostic cancer test that's truly priceless for everything else that's MasterCard. Sorry, it's my poor attempt at some Zoom humor there. All right, um, but beyond that, there are other features and other attributes that we're looking at as well. This is an example in breast cancer patients receiving new adjuvant chemotherapy. The big question is knowing which of these patients is going to have a complete response to the new adjuvant chemotherapy versus patients who will not. And again, looking at the twistedness of the vessels, we've been able to tell as to which of these patients in advance of treatment will actually favorably respond to the chemotherapy versus those patients who are likely to not respond to the chemotherapy. I mentioned immunotherapy very briefly at the beginning. Uh, like I said, this really has been a game changer for lung cancer and a number of other cancers, but the problem is the cost. It's an expensive drug. It's over $250,000 per patient per year, and it only works about 25 to 30% of the time. So if you're talking about you know, four patients being treated with immunotherapy, that's about a million dollars per year. 
given that only one of them will probably respond to the treatment, talking about 750,000 off that million dollars really down the drain, proverbially speaking, in terms of ineffective treatment. We've been looking at the utility of AI with routine CT scans to develop what we call an IOTX. And essentially the idea with an IOTX is to be able to predict response to immunotherapy for lung cancer and significantly reduce the unnecessary costs on account of ineffective treatment. And this is important, not just from the financial aspect, but obviously clearly we wanna make sure that patients are getting the best possible treatment because if you're talking about 75 uh, or 70% 70 of these patients not responding to immunotherapy, well, we wanna make sure that we know that upfront so that instead of giving them treatment regimen A, you know, there are alternatives that could be prescribed for these patients. So um, again, just going back to this concept of vessel tortuosity, we've demonstrated that by looking at the twistedness of the vessels with the AI, we've been able to distinguish between patients who are likely to respond versus patients who are not likely to respond to immunotherapy in advance of treatment, right? So looking at a baseline CT scan in advance of treatment, we're able to really distinguish patients who will and will not respond. And then finally, I want to talk very briefly about the work we're doing around cancer disparities in the context of prostate cancer. This is work we published last year. And one of the things we know is that not all populations will have the, a similar manifestation of the disease. In other words, we know that at a molecular level, at a morphological level, there are differences in cancer between different populations. We've known for a long time that black men tend to have more aggressive prostate cancer. One of the big questions, like I mentioned earlier, is trying to figure out how can we risk stratify men with prostate cancer. And there are a number of different calculators and tools that exist to be able to do this. But the problem is a lot of these tools have been built using populations that have been minor, that have had a very small number of African-American men or underrepresented groups in them. But the vast majority of the data sets that have been used to create the risk calculators have largely been derived from a Caucasian American population. And so it turns out that those calculators don't work that well when applied to black men with prostate cancer. So in this work that we published a couple of years ago, we actually demonstrated a couple of things. One, there were differences in the appearance of prostate cancer between black men and white men. But more critically, we were able to leverage that and create population-specific risk models specifically for black men and found that those population-specific models were way more accurate in predicting the risk of recurrence of prostate cancer in black men compared to a model that was population agnostic. In other words, it didn't really explicitly account for the differences in the appearance of the disease between different populations. And so uh, just to conclude, of course, none of this would be possible without the real stars, the amazing students, um, staff, scientists, postdocs that I have the pleasure and honor of working with at the Center for Computational Imaging and Personalized Diagnostics at Case Western. Um, I'm coming up on nine years um, since I moved to Cleveland and it's really been a fabulous journey. Um, you can see just, um, you know, we, established, we were established in 2012. In the last nine years, uh, we've grown from about 13 people, now over 70 people working in various different aspects of artificial intelligence. Like I mentioned, you know, most of the, um, the, the, the talk today was really focused on imaging and oncology, but as you can see from the slide, you know, we're working in multiple different disease areas. Um, been very uh, fortunate to have had um, significant funding, over $60 million in funding that's helped to support a lot of this infrastructure, but that's come through grants. That's come through research projects and research initiatives. But the other piece of all of this is the technology that we're generating. We're now over a hundred uh, patents that have been uh, issued or awarded or pending to the center. Uh, we're averaging something like a patent, you know, every couple of weeks uh, that's being awarded to the group. And so uh, it's a tremendous opportunity to really build on this infrastructure, this, 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 um, uh, this, this network or ecosystem that we've been managed uh, to create. And just to give you a glimpse of that ecosystem here uh, in Cleveland, uh, obviously with, uh, with CASE and our uh, various different medical partners in Cleveland at the center of this ecosystem, you can see how this ecosystem uh, really permeates at a national level uh, and then at an international level, really addressing so many different diseases um, that uh, can be impacted with technologies like artificial intelligence. And so, you know, I'm, uh, I'm really just, you know, I'm, I'm a, I was born in, in India. I grew up in Mumbai, um, you know, lived, um, lived in many different places in the US. 
Uh, but over the nine years, you know, Cleveland has become home. And uh, I wrote an op-ed for Plains Cleveland uh, a few weeks ago where, you know, I, you know, in my view, I really think that with the huge uh, the technology opportunities, the brain trust that we have in Cleveland, the, the fantastic medical ecosystem that we have in Cleveland, um, I think we really are poised uh, to become the mecca for AI in medicine. And so our group has really been thinking about how can we take the technologies, um, the developments thus far, and really extend that, really build on that. And one of the visions here is to create an artificial intelligence institute for medicine by leveraging the technology by leveraging the, uh, the talent pool, but also, like I said, uh, the medical ecosystem that we are blessed with right here in Cleveland. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you so much for indulging me. Okay, Dr. Matabushi, yeah. uh, I think my video is turned off right now. So if somebody okay. put my video back on, but we do have a question in the chat here. Yeah. When... When we think about the lack of scientific merit when using the social construct of race as a means for differentiating between populations, what opportunities do you foresee for AI in clinical research yeah. and possibilities for using AI to inform precision medicine? Yeah, that, yeah that's a great question. And, and thank you for that. Thank you for pointing out that you know, race is fundamentally a social construct. Uh, and that indeed, I mean, I will freely admit that one of the, um, the, the, the slide that I showed about um, you know, looking at AI uh, for distinguishing cancer in black men and white men, of course, one of the limitations of the study was exactly that, that you know, we, we used a very loose definition of populations and that was largely based of you know, self-identified race or ethnicity. Of course, the, the, the right way of doing that would have been you know, based of um, you know, uh, ethnicity. Um, but Nonetheless, I think the study really conveys the importance of looking at potential differences in the phenotype of disease across different populations. I think that there is overwhelming evidence that the cancers that occur in different populations uh, are different, subtly different, but they are different. Uh, you know, I talked about prostate cancer, triple negative breast cancer is another classic case in point where African women tend to be identified with, that, with triple negative breast cancer at a rate that's three times uh, the, the rate at which it's diagnosed in Caucasian American women. Uh, just this week at the American Society of Clinical Oncology, our group showcased data where we did a similar study looking at endometrial cancers between African American women and Caucasian American women. Again, I will freely admit that one of the limitations there is, you know, we're um, we were using race as, as the basis of defining populations. And, and clearly that, that you know, needs to be addressed going forward. But our, our results um, essentially demonstrated again, uh, the similar findings that we found in the case of prostate cancer, that there were morphologic differences in endometrial cancer between African-American women and Caucasian-American women. And creating population-specific risk models allowed us to get a better sense of the true risk in African-American women compared to models that currently exist that do not account for these differences. There was data that was published earlier this year. I talked about the Oncotype DX test. Um, the Oncotype DX test, again, was largely built off a cohort of, um, of non, um, or, or very few non-white women were represented in the building of these, uh, these risk models. And uh, data that was published earlier this year showed that, that Oncotype DX test was not actually very accurate in African-American women with breast cancer. So to me, it really conveys the point that, you know, one of the opportunities here is for AI to help identify these differences and then create more specific models that really are geared towards those subtle differences that might exist in different populations. We have some other data that we showed earlier this year showing there were differences between South Asian women with breast cancer versus Caucasian-American women with breast cancer. Similarly, we created population-specific models and showed that those models work better for South Asian women with breast cancer. So I think there's a huge opportunity. And, and I think that this is exactly where you know, AI can play a role. You know, there's a lot of talk right now about bias with AI, but I sort of think of it differently. I actually think that there's a way for AI to help unravel and sort of really remove some of these issues around bias, for AI to go and help discover some of the differences that we may not be thinking about or aware of, and then to use those to create these more 
specific models for precision medicine. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Tegan, I will uh, give, the, give the comment back to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, technology is very up and down, as we all have come to know and uh, maybe love in a way in which you're inspired to, to create change through technology. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Matabushi, for that uh, presentation on um, a really important topic, uh, thinking about the ways in which uh, technologies like artificial intelligence can impact diagnosis for lung cancer and prostate cancer specifically, and how the Cleveland ecosystem is so keen to support um, this, this problem. And I want to thank everyone that introduced themselves in the chat. If you haven't yet, um, please feel free to do so. I'd love to know who is in the virtual room today. Uh, but my, Dr. Matabushi, we're talking about AI, AI, uh, this artificial intelligence. I love if we could just uh, talk a little bit about what this technology is and how it helps humans solve problems. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, thank you for that uh, question, Tegan. And I think it, it also dovetails into, uh, I think, a question from Alex about, you know, what exactly, you know, how is expert knowledge really incorporated into AI? Um, so I, I obviously didn't, um, for this talk, didn't get into the nuances, into the subtle uh, minutiae of the AI itself. But one of the things that our group has been doing that I would like to think is, is innovative and distinctive from AI efforts in other parts of the country is that it really incorporates domain expertise. It really incorporates clinical insights into the development of the technology. Now, the two groups or two schools of AI currently, and the, most of what we tend to associate or when we hear about AI, most of that technology is, is largely a black box kind of approach where it's you know, essentially a, a, a machine-based model where data is fed into the machine and machine sort of learns in some sort of unsupervised way. But what the machine learns is very abstract. It's very opaque. And this has been one of the big complaints around traditional, conventional artificial intelligence. On the other hand, our group has made a very deliberate effort to avoid that path. We are uh, taking advantage of the ecosystem, taking advantage of the fact that as a city, uh, while we may not be the largest city in the United States, chances are that per square foot, we probably have more physicians, more MDs per square foot than perhaps any other city in the country. Taking advantage of that ecosystem, uh, you know, we work very, very closely with our clinical colleagues to think about what are the specific kinds of features, what are the kinds of insights that we can incorporate into these machine learning models. And, and I think this is really critical because at the end of the day, when you think about your end users, you've got to be thinking about um, how to adopt these technologies, how would they adopt these technologies? Why would they want to adopt these technologies? How could we embed these technologies into the clinical workflow? And a big part of that is going to be around interpretability. It's going to be about an intuitive understanding of what the machine is learning. And that's why I gave the example with lung cancer, where we were looking at the twistedness of the vessels associated with the nodule on CT scans. And it really was inspired through conversations with our radiology colleagues, with our surgical colleagues. Uh, and it was really a co-development effort where we really understood the domain expertise understood the pathobiology of the disease, and then found a way using machine learning to model those features and incorporate it into the prediction algorithms. Um, and the, the, the advantage then is that because we're developing it in a way that's really informed by that domain expertise, it means that your clinicians are very much involved in the process. They are eager to use these technologies. They have an intuitive understanding of what the technology is picking up, how it works. And when you're making these real high stakes decisions about who, to get, who should get chemotherapy or who should potentially avoid immunotherapy, these are really high stakes decisions. And the conversations and, the, and, the, and the, uh, you know, in our collaborations, what we found is that for these high stakes decisions, interpretability of the AI is really critical. And so you know, we, we take pride in the fact that our tools, our technologies are, are way more interpretable, uh, more intuitive. And I think that's gonna be a, a major driver of clinical adoption, you know, be it diagnosis, prognosis, 
our prediction of therapeutic response. Thank you. Uh, and you mentioned this black box. Um, and I think that that can be some of the hesitation sometimes when we think of AI or machine learning. Um, but really, that means you need a lot of data to fuel this type of technology. Um, so how do you see Cleveland really leading in the needed data uh, for AI? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a great question. And, and I'm going to couple that with uh, I think a question that just came in from Tamara. Um, so you're absolutely right, Tegan, that you know, data is needed. But one of the things that's interesting is that when you are developing these more interpretable tools like the ones that I mentioned, the advantage is that you're informing or infusing into the machine learning model certain features, certain attributes that you want the model to go in and, and specifically seek out. And so in doing that, it actually reduces the burden on the amount of data needed. Now, one of the things that I've truly enjoyed and taken advantage of here in Cleveland is the fact that, you know, um, we have the clinic, we have UH, we've got Metro, we've got the third largest VA in the country in our backyard. And so there's a huge amount of data and resources available that really has you know, served as a, as a fantastic asset for our team to be able to develop the technologies. But it's also about understanding you know, how can you develop technologies in a way that is going to be minimally disruptive for the clinical workflow? Right? A lot of people are trying to disrupt the clinical uh, space, the healthcare space, but it's difficult. You know? And fundamentally, the reason why it's difficult is because practices are very entrenched. It takes a long time to really change things. And a classic case in point is pathology. So pathologists have used the microscope for over 100 years to analyze glass slides. And so when you talk about disrupting a field like pathology, you have to think about disrupting it in a way that pathologists are A, they're not going to be intimidated by, but B, it is not going to add time to their already really busy schedules. And so one of the reasons, and just to back to Tamara's question about artificial, uh, about using H&E images, one of the things that we've really focused on is what is the lowest common denominator? When you look on a worldwide basis, on a global basis, the H&E image, the biopsies are ubiquitous, right? If you've got a cancer patient or you've got a woman who is, um, has, uh, possibly has breast cancer, well, she's gonna get a biopsy and that biopsy is going to yield an H&E image, whether she's in Botswana, whether she's in Cleveland, whether she's in Mumbai, in Dubai or in Sydney. It doesn't matter. She's going to be getting a biopsy. That biopsy is going to yield an H&E image. One of the reasons why we focused on H&E or you know, CT scans or MRI scans is because in some sense, it is the lowest common denominator. It is the kind of imaging data that is being routinely acquired for disease characterization across the globe. And you know, for me, what is really critical is how can we develop tools in a way that can have maximal impact. Um, not some niche technology that is only going to be available at uh, very, very select sites. Um, you know, that's sort of not, not really been our interest. Our, our real motto has been, how can we think about developing technologies from data that is available widely and therefore has a, a maximum likelihood of impact? And so that's why we focus primarily on H&E, but I think that there's certainly value in IHC and other kinds of imaging streams that I uh, provided a uh, sort of short laundry list of the kinds of technologies and data sets that we're also looking at, other kinds of streams of data, the kinds of modes of data that we're also analyzing. Uh, but the, the focus really is on maximizing impact. And so that's why, you know, even though the H&E is, is uh, perhaps not as informative as some of the uh, other kinds of technologies out there, you know, I'd see your quantitative immunofluorescence, but you've got to also balance out just the availability of the technology. And so that's, that dictates um, the approaches we take. That's a very interesting point, uh, increasing access as, you know, the research for these tools is really um, powered by people. I mean, I remember, you know, discovering the HeLa cells and how, you know, it really is individuals that can help move this research forward. Um, 
I believe we do have another question from the audience and you guys please feel free uh, to continue to send those through. Um, this is from Alex. Can such AI technology be used rather than PCR tests used to diagnose viral diseases, for instance, COVID-19? Is this technology different for viral diseases caused by other microbes? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so with the, in fact, just we, we should have a couple of papers coming out uh, very soon where we've used artificial intelligence with routine chest CT scans. Uh, to diagnose uh, diseases like COVID-19, but beyond that, uh, also trying to figure out whether we can predict the severity of COVID-19. Now, hopefully, thankfully, uh, we seem to have passed the phase where, you know, um, we, we are, our ER rooms were, you know, uh, filled with COVID-19 patients, and there was a real situation even just a few weeks ago in India. Um, and, and of course, last year, we recall um, you know, the, 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 the chaotic scenes in New York City, where, uh, you know, there were real concerns about running out of ventilators, right? And, you know, how many ventilators would we have? One of the things that we've been able to do using routine chest CT scans, uh, coupled with clinical parameters as well, is to figure out ways in which we can predict the severity, not just the diagnosis of COVID-19, but the severity of COVID-19, and therefore figure out whether somebody is actually going to require mechanical ventilation versus not. Uh, but apart from that, we've also been partnering with a local Cleveland-based com company in applying this technology uh, for looking at identification of tuberculosis, uh, TB from sputum samples. It's, a, it's an initiative that we have uh, where we are now uh, trying to pilot these studies in South Africa and Uganda. Uh, we are also working on trying to understand fundamentally what are the differences between different viral diseases like COVID-19 versus H1N1? Uh, are there specific patterns that the AI can prize out that could really distinguish between these different kinds of influenza, these different kinds of uh, viruses? Last year, through a partnership between the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center, as well as Uganda and Tanzania, we were awarded a U54 grant from the National Cancer Institute to apply AI technologies for identifying tuberculosis in HIV positive patients in uh, Uganda and Tanzania. So that's an ongoing uh, project uh, involving a number of folks here in Cleveland as well as in Africa. So there's, there's a lot of, again, I just come back to the point that we're just scratching the surface at this point. I think there's just so many different opportunities where this kind of technology could be leveraged and applied. Yes, and on the same vein as, as COVID-19, I'm interested what new challenges has COVID-19 presented to healthcare professionals and on the other end, um, what has been the experience of patients and how has this contributed to that financial toxicity that you spoke about earlier? No, that's a great point. I think it has had significant impact. Um, I think I would say that you know, there's clearly the, the, the financial piece that I talked about, but I think the concern that I have really with COVID-19 is that there's so little that we still understand about the disease and understand almost nothing about the longer term impact the disease will have on patients, right? I mean, that we've had, thankfully, a number of patients, uh, more patients have recovered from the disease than have not. But I still worry about the long term implications of the disease. Um, you know, we've heard all about the, the, the lingering side effects of the disease and what are the implications going to be. And, and you know, working with uh, investigators at Case Western, we've started to try to probe at some of these questions, for instance, trying to figure out what the long-term impact on lung function might be, and could we use imaging and AI to start to make some predictions about that. Um, but the fact is that this just has been a really tumultuous year um, on, on many different levels. Um, and I you know, feel that we, we still have a long way to go. And I think, you know, AI could play a role in trying to understand, like I said, the longer term implication, the longer term impact and outcome of the disease. You know, the, the, the vital load might have reduced and, you know, um, that, that these patients might have recovered, but how are they going to be doing in terms of lung function or, you know, uh, neurodegenerative conditions, you know, four years, five years down the road? We don't know. Um, but, you know, we're starting to use 
AI with imaging to start to ask some of those questions. We just got a great question in, but I'd like to kind of prep that question with the conversation on um, why is AI relevant to medicine and how can bridging multiple sciences uh, really lead innovation, especially in a city like Cleveland? Yeah, so I think that a um, couple, of, couple of things there. One is, I think in Cleveland in particular, uh, Cleveland, like I said, you know, I'd like to think that it become um, you know, a, um, I've, I've adopted or Cleveland has adopted me and I've adopted Cleveland and um, you know, I feel like Cleveland is home. But you know, after nine years of being here, I think you get the license to also look at your home and criticize your home, right? I think that that's, that's fair after nine years. And so you now while Cleveland has this fantastic ecosystem, medical ecosystem that we talked about, the fact is that it does have a not very great track record in terms of the equity, right? In terms of health equity, in terms of social equity. And I generally feel that that's a particular area where artificial intelligence can help uh, try to you know, level the playing field a little bit, where um, these kinds of technologies can really play a role in um, addressing some of these issues around health disparities. And one of the, the, the nascent projects, you know, we don't have, it's still very, very nascent, but we have been working with university hospitals for a number of years on lung cancer screening. One of the things that we do know is that for our, our, our friends, our, our, our neighbors in, in underrepresented uh, groups and, and, and sort of minority populations, there is a significant level of anxiety in you know, going to a hospital or getting a checkup done or getting a screening exam done. And one of the things that we are working with our partners at university hospitals to try to address is how can we bring the technology to uh, these communities that are not getting the kind of access uh, for a variety of different reasons? And how can we try to remedy that? How can we help to address those issues? And so this is, I think, a, a big opportunity that, you know, it's, it's both, it's a challenge, but I see that potentially therefore as an opportunity as well. And so one of the things that we're really looking to do is how can we bring clinical medicine, radiology, bioengineering together to really have an impact to address these issues of disparities? Because we do know that Cleveland as a city, uh, you know, we, do, we don't have a great track record in terms of, of uh, health disparities. There is a big divide. And let's just be frank about that. Let's acknowledge that. And so I think that this is the opportunity to bring technologies like this uh, to help to address uh, some of these challenges. So that's certainly an area that you know, we're very focused on and want to try to chip away uh, towards that goal. Thank you for that response. Um, and unfortunately, this is going to be our last question, um, but I love that it's from the audience. Um, what role or roles can non-clinical, -te non-technical individuals play in development of AI technology in healthcare in Cleveland? Uh, and I'd love to add, um, how can uh, encouraging creativity in the healthcare space uh, really impact this as well? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, that's a really great question. Thank you for asking that question. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I could, just talking about my group uh, itself, you know, we, while most of the folks in my group are, are fairly technical, you know, over the last, uh, last two to three years, we've started to expand um, our group. And, you know, we have people who are doing art, people who are coming in and, um, you know, helping in, in, in many different ways, people who are helping with you know, just things like, you know, marketing and, and, and visibility. I mean, one of the, the challenges I think that we have as a city is that we don't do a good job in really uh, trumpeting out our accomplishments. And one of, the, um, one of the things that we've started to pay a lot more attention to is to make sure that we're getting the word out uh, with respect to our, um, our, our successes, our accomplishments. And so I think that there's a big opportunity uh, for you know, multiple different sectors to play a role uh, in developing uh, this, this concept of this AI Institute you know, here in Cleveland. And a big part of this will also be the outreach where you know, we are partnering with other institutions. And one of the things that we have done recently is we just signed a memorandum of understanding with Hampton University, which is 
an HBCU out in Virginia. And one of the things that we are actively doing right now is working with HBCUs. I, I just gave us a, a talk at Mihari Medical Center in Nashville uh, a few weeks ago and, and finding ways in which we can get the message across uh, to um, you know, other institutions like the HBCUs, working with them, uh, you know, essentially engaging students from the HBCUs uh, as part of internships, um, you know, uh, remote mentoring opportunities. Uh, we're also working with a number of Cleveland schools, engaging you know, high school students. We have a number of high school students doing uh, remote virtual internships in our lab uh, over the summer. And so I think that you know, there are um, you know, multiple opportunities to engage. Uh, this is you know, a big undertaking, and this is really going to you know, take uh, multiple hands-on deck, uh, people with different backgrounds, different expertise, um, you know, working together. But I think it's exciting. And I do think that given that we have all the right ingredients in place right here in Cleveland, um, I think that you know, we probably do need some more resources um, to be sunk in. But you know, if, I think that's the easy part. right? I think if we, the, the resources, the, the economic piece, I think that's the easy part. But the good news is that the ingredients are in place. And I think we're well positioned, really, uh, like I said, in that op-ed piece to, to really make you know, Cleveland the mecca for AI in medicine. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm sure the audience did as well. And I'll turn it over to Rick. Thank you so much, Dr. Matabushi. Um, and thanks to everybody for, for joining. We had a, another great session. I, I, I hope you learned a lot about uh, AI and Cleveland here and, and the exciting work that, um, that Dr. Matabushi is doing. Um, the next Innovation Intersections is scheduled for the end of this month, June 30th, with uh, the president of UH Ventures, David Sylvan. Uh, we're excited. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to join us. It'll be another noontime event. Um, but starting in July, we're very excited. We're going to try to start uh, and think about doing these in person and hopefully have a location with enough space and hope and potentially outdoors where we can host uh, some of the rest. So stay tuned for future in-person sites. Uh, also, just to plug a few other Midtown events that are going on, you can obviously follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Uh, we've launched new career services hotlines. We have a Juneteenth celebration coming up next week. Uh, food trucks are back in Midtown. So every Tuesday, stop by. Uh, Colonel Young Park, uh, 1130 to 130, and also our continuing community conversations about real estate will be uh, next Thursday night, uh, 6 to 730. So thanks again. Thank you, Tegan. Thank you, Dr. Matabushi. Uh, thanks to everybody who attended. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.